welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the next instalment of the Backpack series that I'm hoping you can all sink your teeth into. Of course, as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Backpack Off the Trail Part 5 Three Little Pigs Let's get straight into that. Well, that that was the last time I seen him. Tick's words echoed in our minds that night as we all settled down for some much needed rest. I think the Stark reminded that any one of us could go missing at any moment way out here in the swamp was heavy in each of our consciousness. But we pushed it as far back in our minds as we could. We awoke the next day to a warm and bright morning, the rays of sunlight dazzling a sleepy Cathy and I as they traced in through the small window above the door. Tick was already up and roasting the fire back to life and had some grits, eggs and bacon on the go. He turned to us, a smile across his wrinkled face and greeted us with a good morning explorers as he passed each of us a steaming cup of coffee. Thanks Tick, Cathy replied as she grabbed the steaming cup. I was a little dazed and sleeping and sat idly watching the flickering flames at the fire dance. Everyone else was still asleep and Mark and Connie had taken all of the blankets from Ed and Katrina, whilst Josh lay sprawled out in the corner on some old sacks of grain. And the smell of bacon was soon wafting and everyone started to rise. Tick got up to go outside to fetch some more fresh water and looked to be in a good mood. And now in the daylight that crept its way through the mould and crannies of his cabin, I could make out more of his details and features. His complexion was a healthy golden tan. His face told a thousand stories through the wrinkles that creased with his smile. An elderly man, but obviously strong as an ox, and with square set shoulders and big hands. Even as just a regular human, he would have been a formidable opponent in his prime. As my eyes followed him out the door and back to the fire, I spotted the backpack. That mouldy, dank holdall that had unnerved us all as much as it intrigued us. As Tick came back through, I reached for it and noticed it stopped mid-stride. And feeling a little unnerved and sensing the change in atmosphere, I cast my gaze up to meet his face. A moment of utter silence save for the bacon sizzling away past. The old man's face and brow furrowed and he almost looked perplexed. Tick, are you okay? I asked as he stared blankly at the backpack at my feet. Tick, I once again tried to get his attention but hopelessly failed. The old man's eyes welled up with tears and his usual rosy cheeks had lost all colour. What's the matter, Tick? Cathy and Stacy both asked him calmly. Aye, aye, the words fumbled out of his mouth. Where did you get that? He finally managed suddenly taking a seat in his rickety rocking chair. What? Uh, this backpack? We found it a few days ago, or rather I did. It was just off one of the trails hidden in some brush. I said as he gestured for me to pass the backpack over to him. I immediately did so and looked at Danny and Jim as I did so. I didn't know if Tick was mad or what, but I knew either way I was going to find out. He placed it onto the floor at his feet and sighed heavily, fiddling around for a second or two and then nodding. Yeah, he muttered, when suddenly it came to me. It all made sense. The faded name tag. I can't believe it. This is Johnny's. I remember it like it was yesterday. Tick finally responded. Tick, can I, can I ask you something? I asked hesitantly, and he nodded. How well did you... 
Uh, where did you know Johnny? I mean, I know you said you were cool with each other. But did he ever speak about his past or anything to do with hunting? I added as Tick's one good eye glared at me, awaiting my next question. Well, come to think of it, he did seem to clam up whenever I asked him about his folks and life. What are you getting at, son? Tick said as he hesitated to open the backpack. My heart raced as I knew it wasn't going to be what he wanted to find in there. Instead, it was a box of worms that would fester and eat away at him, for however long a werewolf lives these days. But maybe it was a lesson worth learning. Maybe it would help him not feel so guilty for Johnny's disappearance, but a painful lesson, no less. There's some, some strange items inside. I, I, I don't know how to explain them, but, but I don't think Johnny was who he said he was, Tick. And Tick's eyes opened slightly wider and then narrowed before he nodded again and unzipped the largest compartment. His eyes grew wide as he retrieved a handful of wallets and identification cards. He glanced back up to meet my eyes with a look of pure puzzlement. There's more, I'm afraid, Kathy added. Tick then proceeded to go through all of the contents and retrieve each item out and onto the floor in front of him. Lastly was the side compartment with the dreadful jar of canines. I didn't know how he was going to react to that one, most of all. But as the minutes of silence went by and I began serving up breakfast, Tick sifted his way through the notes and newspapers. He grabbed the jar again while shaking his head with disbelief. Wild and tarnation, he said softly. Well, it looks like he was tracing the steps and bloodlines of three families, local to here. I asked for that jar of teeth well. Well, I don't really know, brother, but I think Johnny was part of a cult or maybe even a hunter of cryptids. There's a lot of information that supports that idea, but I know you will want to look through this yourself. I commented calmly and tried to show a bit of support for the poor guy. I mean, all of these years he had been here by himself and had this cloud of guilt that just hung over him like a lead weight. It can't have been easy. And so, over the course of the next five or so hours, the new guys and Tick, Kathy and Stacy, hell, all of us sifted through a conspiracy theorist wonderland. Further notes, I had not picked up the first few times browsing through the contents of this backpack suddenly stood out. Mainly, a scruffy set of notes on journal paper that had yellowed over the years and was haphazardly stapled together. The overview was a coordinated steps, a bloodline or family from Germany had taken centuries ago, arriving with the first settlers in New Orleans and then seemingly disappearing into the vast wilds of 1700s America. Mentions of said bloodline battling for control decades later occur in Kentucky, Michigan and Ohio. Then from around 1880 onwards, the bloodline splices three ways and each seemingly taken a coastal territory each. First there was the Gunter family, taken the east coast, the Larson family taken the west coast, and finally the Granger family, who decided to take the south coast, or, or as it appears rather they kept the south coast and much of the midwest regions. Either way, it seems they held dominance over the other two, and from there the legends that we all know and love were born. Well, I'll be damned, Tick announced with a growl in his voice. That lying son of a, he declared. What you got, Tick? I asked as Tick threw me a stack of notebooks and a couple of loose articles cut from different newspapers. I caught the majority of it and Kathy scooted closer to me as I began going through them. As I and Kathy began sifting through the paperwork and articles, Tick roped the vial onto a piece of leather cord and hung it around his neck for safekeeping. And almost right away, I knew what Tick was so mad at. At the top of the pile was a notebook, and on the opening notebook, bam, right there at the top of page one. Top secret. Classified information. No unauthorized access. Level 25, clearance. Case file, 04005. 
362-117-004. Subject name, Bennett Roger. Age, 55. Aliases, Tick, Glenn Stafford, Clive Knowles, Roger Bentley. Many more assume, but unknown. Holy shit! I exclaimed and pointed to the page for Cathy to see. I continued reading as my pulse raced. Subject species, lycanthrope. Level, 10 plus. Hybrid program, initiated. Status, escaped. Status of location, Ohio, Georgia, New Orleans and Oklahoma. Presume Georgia most likely after extensive research and tracking. Must confirm. Known skills and attributes. Highly trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques. Martial arts graduate in multiple disciplines. Extensive knowledge and experience of weaponry and guerrilla warfare tactics. Show true merit and courage during subjects active duty to subjects country. Ranked top sniper scout three years in a row, progressing on to lead one of the most successful scout teams in modern history. Side Notation Due to subjects' enhanced abilities and skills already in place, the factor of the facility's procedures, further enhancing subjects' power, senses and dexterity, has been nothing short of a complete success. But believe me, Somebody's head will roll for the incompetence shown in allowing the subject's chance of escape. Teams will need to be built. Training will need to be ramped up a gear and one of you assets fix this issue immediately. This is to be kept in-house, people. Not a word to the Bureau or CIA. Do not disappoint me, gentlemen. Signed, General H.J. Bracken, U.S. Army. You was right. He wasn't who he said he was. I've been a fool letting him get so close to me. How could I be so stupid? Tick groaned aloud as he rubbed his head in his hands. This is mind-blowing, Tick. I can't believe how much you've been through, or how much effort they're going to, just to find out where you disappeared to. I said exasperated with the whole situation. Me neither, youngster, but... I should have expected this. I should have been more careful and asked a few more questions. Once again, Tick sank his head into his hands and took a deep breath of air before looking back up. We all sat, transfixed, awaiting his next words. Tick reached into the other pockets of the backpack and retrieved the blade, wrapped in cloth. Then nodded his head as he unwrapped the short sword and held it up to the light, shining through the small window. Well now, this must be the ceremonial sword I mentioned. And that must be what the potion do hickeys for. Tick then pushed and twisted the bottom of the sword, and at the base of the handle, an opening appeared. Inside was a small, tattooed piece of sheepskin. It said sheepskin that Tick and Johnny had acquired through Klaus in Germany. Either way, Tick looked all the more happy for it, and Stacy took possession of the strange and foul-smelling sheepskin, and would no doubt work on it as we progressed. And so, instead of being down and looking beaten, Tick glanced over at Stacy, and then David, then me and Kathy, before the rest, and said, Ah, oh, come on now. Let's not let the food get cold. I cooked us a feast, so let's eat, and then beat it. We have a young lady to save, and a man, it's been too long since I kicked somebody's ass. Most of all, at the top of my list is that nasty brute. But I warn you now, young'uns, he's likely to have a small army of lesser wolves loyal to him and his commands. If you want to head out and get on with your lives whilst you still can't have them, and all of your appendages too, I understand completely. I'll help you as best I can, but... One thing is for sure, I ain't waiting around for however long it's going to take for a werewolf like myself to die. I say, let's shake this swamp to its roots. Let's take the fight to him and 
get you young'uns back home. Tick boomed as he arose from the rocking chair. One last dance with the devil. What you say? He added his hands on his hips and chest out proudly, awaiting his troops. Response. Let's frickin' do this, I declared as I stood and grabbed Tick's huge, leathery hand. Would a firm shake and a nod. Danny was up next and soon enough we all had gathered our supplies and equipment. Once we were set, Tick drew up a crude map over our one of the swamp's inhabitants and their territories. He pointed out where there are these hotspots for time slips or portals. Said we would know when we were close to one as the feeling of dread and a strange buzzing sound could be heard. And then he showed us where we were most likely to find Louise and where we needed to steer clear of. He said there were much worse things in this swamp than werewolves and skinwalkers. Something ancient and diabolical all at once. The less heard of Gugwe, aka the Face Eater. Tick explained he had only crossed paths with the species on a handful of occasions, and when he did, he was lucky to escape with his head still attached to his body. They have a similar cousin in that of the Sasquatch, but the two's character and appetite are far from similar. Safe to say we were all in agreement that having our faces eaten by a mad monkey man was near the top of the don't-do list, and Tick chuckled as he could see the trepidation written on all of our expressions. Ah, don't worry. I doubt we'll even be noticed. I think. He added as he turned and made his way outside for some fresh air and to stretch his legs for a spell. We each slowly followed him one by one through the door and out into the front yard of sorts. And Tick explained that we needed to follow him as closely as possible and to heed any instructions as if our lives depended on it, which in fact... They quite literally did. And so, without a minute more to change our minds and head for home, we followed Tick as he wound his way off to our right and into the dense wall of brush and trees. None of us making a sound. Myself and Cathy stayed close together as we hopped over fallen trees and ducked under those we couldn't. Around two hours later and we hadn't let up the pace, our clothes were drenched in sweat and my feet were already raw after such arduous hiking the last few days. But trek we did, and the swamp seemed quieter, almost as if it was completely void of life, except for ourselves, of course. My mind cast back to our interactions with the creatures of this swamp, and each a formidable opponent, by their own right. And soon we reached a good spot for a rest and planned our next direction. Tick explained that he was certain we were approaching the Dogman Pack's territory, and that we must remain as quiet as possible, but move at a brisk pace. He told us that their numbers were unknown to him, but he had no intention of letting them know we were here. Ah, whatever you do, don't be the first to attack. If you see one, wait for it to react. Sometimes they're just curious, other times... <laughs> I tell you this, if you see one, you better believe it's not alone. Okay? Everybody ready? Let's move on. He added firmly before moving forward at a low level. As we moved into this area, we noticed how much the trees covered the sunlight that was now high in the sky above us. The shadows seemed to play tricks with their eye, and there was a low-lying mist hovering over the ground and water. We continued into this topography until we came to a small clearing with a high bank of boulders and earth. Set into the bank was a small cave mouth, just big enough to crouch and enter. We stopped and a few of the guys were taking pictures and I and Jim were talking to Tick, reviewing the map and asking him what was in the cave. And Tick was animated and whispering what he knew about the cave system. I and Jim were engrossed in our conversation, but we didn't notice that Connie, from the other group of campers we had met, she was now following Mark, who had begun completely clambering in and down into the mouth of the small cave. Mark's and her flashlights from their cell phones bobbing around as they inspected the tunnel deeper. When suddenly we hear a crunch and a falling of rocks, immediately our conversation was done as Tick gasped aloud, 
and shot over to them at superhuman speed. The rest of us followed suit to the right to see Tick pulling Connie and Mark from the cave mouth. Damn, you kids have messed up. What did I say about staying close by? Tick scolded him as his one good eye seemed to grow a shade of deep red. But he soon regained his composure and asked them what happened. They began awkwardly explaining how they wanted to get a better look. They saw some bowls and candles, almost like a ceremonial chamber. And there was various artifacts that looked ancient, and they were decorating the walls and floor. It was beautiful, said Connie. But as I turned to come back out, I lost my balance and fell to the right, cracking three of these bowls and knocking some of the bones away. Ah, oh, you idiots, scolded Dave, and Tick shook his head in disbelief. I must admit, I was even a little surprised they were that stupid. Josh and Katrina looked shocked and Ed took a walk to cool down. I heard him cussing them out as he paced off a few metres away, shaking his head vigorously. They're nowhere here, folks. We better prepare for a meeting real soon. You two just desecrated an Indian burial mound, and said mound is said to be protected by the old spirits and the pack. Ah, we're in a lot of shit, and I just hope we can reason with them. If not... Tick paused, his eye glaring into Connie and Mark. If not, then we're as good as dead. The pair tried to protest and apologise, but... <laughs> it was already too late. Let's move on, folks, and keep your ears open for any sounds. Though I'm sure I'll smell the mangy bastards when they come for us. Tick added as he set off once more, heading west and down a small game trail. Myself and Kathy, Jim, Stacy and Danny, all looking at each other with raised eyebrows. Not more than 10 or 20 minutes later, and we knew we had company. From off a ways to our right came a long and drawn out howl that seemed to go on for more than a minute or more. We all stopped in unison and looked to our right, and then from our left came another mournful howl, and it was soon answered from our rear. We all turned as each direction there came a call, a call to arms. Oh, he prayed not. Huh. Okay. Well, let's keep on moving. By my estimate, we have around three more miles until we leave their territory. But I don't know if they're going to worry about that after what you two idiots did. Tick growled and turned quickly, walking away and onwards in the direction we had already sat on. Soon there came loud cracks and pops of timber being smashed or snapped. All around we could hear their heavy breathing as the pack closed in on our group. The sky was now taking its final steps before sundown, and the light shower had started to descend. This made the trail all the more difficult as we slipped and fell over boulders and more fallen trees. Every now and then, we would come across a strange object hanging from a branch or staked into the earth. My belief was that these were warnings or messages of sorts, a way of letting the neighbourhood know who's in town and who was who around this swamp. But we never stopped and took a closer look, and as another five or so intense minutes went by, they made their move, and three launched themselves over our heads in a canopy above. The growls and horrendous odour seemed to intensify the aggressive atmosphere. I had now grabbed a hold of Kathy's arm as we made our way much quicker down the trail, when suddenly, without warning, there came an almighty roar as the Alpha leapt from the brush and landed smack bang in the middle of our path. The soft earth moving under his enormous weight as he sank a few inches into it. He glared at us with eyes that seemed to glow into the fading twilight hour, his hot breath wafting from his maw in the big bellowing clouds. Tick immediately stopped and put his arms out in front of Kathy and I, shushing us audibly as I'm certain all of our hearts dropped a thousand miles an hour to the ground. My breath hitched in my throat and I held it for God knows how long. I couldn't take my eyes off of his and somehow... <laughs> Somehow Tick knew this. He suddenly, and without turning around, said, Take them eyes off him, Michael. You don't like it when you look him in the eye. 
Oh, shit. Yeah, sorry. I responded and bowed my head lower, whilst turning to Cathy. She remained head low and I could see her trembling terribly. I reached out and held her hand, cracking a small smile. For a second, I saw her face soften a little. Tick walked forward. As all around us from the shadows and from above there were dogmen. They remained semi-hidden in the undergrowth and foliage, but we could make out enough to make anyone lose their mind with terror. Ah, listen up. Not trying to move in on your gig you got going on over here. The alpha's eyes narrowed a little as he let out another deep... <sighs> and Tick continued. I realise what they did can never be undone. I realise you have a duty to uphold, a pact to command and lead. But they're just stupid kids. They're trying to save their friend from that other asshat over the ridge. I know you know who I mean. Now come on, please. Just let us get on now, and I promise we won't even stop for a break. What do you say? And Tick finished his speech to the PAX leader and committee. The Alpha roared a tremendous roar that echoed throughout the now dark swamp. The PAX joined in answer to Tick's request, and it appeared to be a resounding no. And then, as we began to panic and Danny, Jim and I grabbed our firearms. I seemed to lose my hearing as adrenaline coursed through my system. And Tick shouted, Hey, how about this? I best you and they get to walk. If I lose, then you can kill us all. And then with a mighty chest rumbling roar, he transformed and howled into the knight himself. And by comparison, Tick was larger than many of these specimens of dogmen. Even so, their numbers were shocking, when I would hazard a guess at 30 or 40, or possibly more. Now fully transformed, Tick slashed his claws at the wet earth, sending it into the Alpha's face and growled once more. The Alpha wiped his brow and face and then assumed a crouched position, poised and ready to strike. Each of us panicked and huddled into a tight circle as Tick assumed the same posture. The pack surrounding us began howling and hollering into the night and grew with excitement. They shook the branches and snapped at the twigs and long grass uprooting them before throwing them at us. And what happened next was a matter of seconds yet seemed to happen in slow motion. And suddenly, out of nowhere, two or more dogmen ran into our circle and grabbed a hold of Connie, dragging her off into the opposite brush. Three more surged forward and myself and the guys turned on their ambush attempt with weapons drawn. They slid to a stop only a couple of steps away from us and glared at our firearms. It was obvious they were fully aware what our weapons could do, and that seemed to scare me more to think how intelligent these creatures truly were. Mark then suddenly broke from the circle and ran off after Connie, letting off a spray of shots sporadically and without aim. And he didn't make it two steps into the trees and brush before there was a wet crunch and a dull thud. Mark's head came tumbling down the small rise and onto the path in front of us and still Connie's screams could be heard getting more and more desperate, until eventually her demise was due. And as her wailing pleas for help cried out one more time, there came a shrill shriek and then that same cold, familiar silence. Moments later, her head also rolled and lay looking straight up at my eyes. Connie's eyes looked into mine and I swear she could still register what was happening. For a few minutes, her eyes blinked and searched left and then right, before finally they stopped on mine. And they stayed there and never moved again. Three more dogmen lunged and Danny put three in the head of one, whilst the other two backed off growling and beating the ground with fury. We kept our cool and trained our weapons ready for any more attacks. Of the two remaining dogmen making a slow and angry retreat, one of them slowly whilst maintaining eye contact, reached down and grabbed a hold of the lifeless comrade laying in front of Danny. And slowly, it pulled the carcass back into the dense swamp. And all the while, the other one growled and slowly walked backwards until it too had disappeared behind the cypress trees and brush. 
Now panicking even more, we covered ourselves again like prey, bunching together as the two big guys got ready to duel. Tick was not going to let anything happen to us and that I was sure of even at the time. His transformation was a force of nature, spiked with the best minds concoctions. <laughs> I don't think the Alpha truly knew what he was in for. We as a group weren't about to go down without a fight. The Alpha was first to make a move, launching itself at Tick in a surprise attack. But Tick was quick to counter, and in one turn grabbed the Alpha by his neck and then slammed him face first into the ditch to our left. Tick let out a loud and hearty chuckle before going to grab him once more. But as he got closer, the Alpha sprang up and used a small boulder to spring from left to right before slashing his long claws across Tick's chest and arms. He launched and landed like a cat and immediately went in for a second attack. But Tick, well, he was way ahead of him and uppercuts the Alpha mid-air, setting him half-conscious into a thick tree trunk. The pack audibly seethed with tension and some bluff charges and tick. But the Alpha just started to rise to his feet again. Blood began pouring from his maw. When suddenly, all around us the ground started to rumble and the earth began to break apart. We were clueless as to what was about to happen. Us and, I think, even the dogmen. As dust and earth was clouding all around us, a great noise or droning sound of biblical proportions erupted from the ground. And then a portal or split in the fabric of reality and dimension appeared out of nowhere. Huge lumbering Sasquatch-like figures holding long clubs and various arrays of weaponry walked out of the portals. As they did, bright blue and white light began to burst from the earth that still tremored. And suddenly, a dozen or more figures appeared to rise from the earth itself. We as a group, even the Dogman and Tick, were cowering and covering our ears and eyes as the environment was so overwhelming. And then the dust and noise settled, and the roaring of the Dogman even seemed to halter for that moment. As leaves and dust carelessly fell back down to the ground, before us and between us and the Dogman were these great beings. They were the Sasquatch and the land spirits, ancestors to the tribe's men and women. The Sasquatch were from another dimension and spent their lives travelling from different dimensions, using portals as the means. Their very job was protecting the fabric of time and reality. The land spirits were also something truly mesmerising. They were tall and powerful looking, dressed in beautiful traditional Native American attire. Some held long staffs, while others had bows and arrows. Pure, elemental energy swam all around us, and they glowed a deep emerald green, and some even a pale turquoise blue. All around us, time and tempest seemed to no longer exist, and Tick immediately took to one knee and bowed his head. I glanced around him, and the Alpha was still standing, panting heavily and looking to his left and then right at the huge, powerful Sasquatch. He raised his hand, and the surrounding dogmen pack eased off the tension, and all one by one taken a knee. When that was done, finally, the Alpha looked to one of the spirits and bowed his head before taking a knee also. It was clear who held true power of the swamp and lands, or maybe it was just a political thing between the pack and the spirits. But one thing was clear, they had intervened and saved our bacon. After a moment or so, Tick arose from his kneeling position to meet the spirit eye to eye. A warm smile swept across his face, and although no words were spoken with the spirit, it was clear that Tick could understand what message they had for him. The Alpha slowly arose and joined Tick at his side, and for what felt like an eternity, they stood there hashing out a deal or whatever they were up to. At one point, the Alpha seethed with anger, and I heard him audibly growl that same chest-rumbling growl. Myself and the guys just tried to stay calm and held our position, now with weapons lowered. The spirit's apparent leader hovered forward, and that loud booming drone erupted from the earth, 
The pack howling like crazy and began to break ranks and some even choosing to flee off and into the swamp. The tall spirit slammed his long staff down onto the ground with a tremendous thump. And the Alfred Dogman visibly shook and had to take a step back to steady himself. And finally, he too lowered his huge head and slowly nodded before turning and slowly walking off and into the trees and brush. As he turned and slowly left, the look he gave Tick on us was chilling, to say the least. But soon he was gone, and his pack howling and hollering faded as they two followed their wounded and slightly ticked off leader. <laughs> ticked off, that's a good one. Anyway, Tick turned after another minute of mind speak with the spirit. He thanked them all aloud and returned to our position. And slowly, one by one, the spirits left us, disintegrating into the wind, until only one remained, the leader. He raised his hand and spoke to all of us and said, Your path is pure of heart and your burden is one of love. What happened with the sacred ground was not of your doing. That score has been settled. Go forward with great care. Find your friends, but be warned. The Dark One's presence is strong and his mind cunning. He has many followers. Go forward and we will guide you on this journey for as long as we can. Farewell, dear travelers. And with that, he disintegrated with the wind and back to the other side of the veil, I guess. The Sasquatch turned and one by one left through the same portal they had arrived with, heading to goodness knows where and for goodness knows what purpose. We all sighed a huge sigh of relief and made a hasty push forward while sidestepping around Mark's and Connie's dead-eyed stare. The swamp's ambience returned for the first time in four or more days, which was equally strange as much as it was comforting. Hours later, we finally left the pack's territory, and it must have been around two in the morning. We each slumped down on a small overhang of bedrock. The rain had turned into a downpour. We were soaked through, but it was refreshing after days and days of hiking. Well, this ought to do. We should be safe here for the night. Tick commented while setting about digging a dugout in the earth against the rock wall. This way we could have a small fire and still keep warm, whilst not giving away our position during the night. As the early hours crept ever closer, the swamp fell deathly silent once more. Each of us in turn looking to each other, and with a look of trepidation written on all of our faces. Tick sat up and whispered to us, Stay here, and keep quiet, I'ma take a look-see. We nodded in response as he got up and scooted off down the trail and out of sight. Nobody moved, nobody said a word. Minutes seemed to drag on and on without a single noise or disturbance, when suddenly there came a loud ruckus and commotion. Squeals and grunting roars. Seconds later, Tick rounded the corner of the trail and came rushing into our camp. We gotta move, now! He screamed and grabbed a hold of Stacy and Kathy, helping them to their feet. In the distance, not too far off, we could hear more and more of that chilling, excited squealing from different directions. Again, I heard a loud squeal, like a huge hog, but we didn't stick around to find out. What's going on, goddammit? Screamed Dave as he hobbled still battered and bruised from his attack the previous days before. No time, just move it, boy. Scolded Tick as he took the lead and we all ran out of camp, heading due west and towards goodness knows where. It was the middle of the night and it was the deepest of dark out. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And brambles and branches whipped and tore at my face and hands. A couple of us fell ass overhead as we blindly ran through the swamp, and behind us the squilling and roaring grew closer and closer as we ran, but seemed to come from three different directions all at once. The sounds rang out across the hollows and echoed back, consuming all of us again with pure terror. 
Once we had a bit of distance between us and the distant noises, we as a group slowed our pace and the sounds seemed to head off in a different direction. Adrenaline had pushed us at superhuman speed. I turned to Tick and said, What was it? I asked breathlessly, trying to catch my breath as he walked back and forth, looking to the distance and sniffing the air with long inhales. Nothing good, boy, that's for sure. There was three of them. Damn sneaky fuckers, if you ask me. He responded, reaching into his pocket and retrieving his Zippo lighter. Then, lighting his pipe, he continued. I guess you young'uns would call them the pig man. That's what old Johnny would call them. Nasty things and brutal too. If you can believe it, they're another government experiment gone wrong. Apparently they escaped from a facility over in Florida. Least, that's what Johnny said. He read on the dark web. I guess they went feral after a time and decided to make residence in good old Barn Swamp. Now I've had the displeasure of meeting two of these beasts and they are beasts in all sense of the word. When I came upon their burrow or nest, I could smell the decay from a ways away and I followed it for ten or so minutes. And soon I came upon their home. Damn thing was pretty big too. It was cut into the rise of earth and down into the ground, like a fox's den. There was long brush and branches, grew or were laid all around the outside and perimeter, and it kind of created a wall of sorts. Outside lay bones and tissue, with chunks of rotting meat hanging to dry out. As I sat there listening, inside there had to be a lost hiker or hunter. I could hear and I could smell them from outside. Their wails of agony and moans and gasps for freedom were accompanied by hungry grunts and the snapping of bones. As I was poking my head over the outside wall, if you will, they came rushing out of the entrance, sniffing around and snorting like their brethren. And within seconds, both of them turned on a dime towards my location and locked eyes with me. I let out a, oh shoot, before turning and leaving as fast as I could. Hell, out here, you can't afford to get injured. Even if you are a model, damn bugs will be feeding off you for months as you heal up. It ain't fun, let me tell you. Anyway, I hightail it out of there as they give chase and I can hear them smashing through timber to keep pace with me. And so they have to be strong. Eventually, I took to the trees and left them running around in circles for hours in search of me. Whilst they did, I witnessed them take a full-grown Sasquatch down and begin tearing it to shreds. Ah, that poor sucker must have heard the commotion and come to check it out. And so, that's why we needed to move, boys and girls. Now, we better keep on moving, okay? Tick finished, turning to Dave and glaring a little. He nodded to I and Danny before turning and heading down the way we were headed before stopping. As we continued, every now and then we would hear a large piece of timber breaking, and it sounded like large whole trees were being brought down. When suddenly, out of the brush, a pigman burst and crossed our path, snatching up Josh in one swift motion. Josh barely managed to yelp as the pigman crashed into him, and knocked Ed and Katrina aside. Tick and I glanced to each other. Run! He shouted as Josh's panic cries abruptly stopped. We gasped and left the area fast as the other two pigmen closed in on our group. And then, after what must have been half an hour of straight frantic running, Tick stopped and motioned for us to creep inside of a small cave opening. I was well hidden enough that, even in a day, you could walk right past it. It suddenly wasn't a comfortable or gracious entrance for anyone. It must have been a nightmare for anybody claustrophobic. <laughs> They'd have a breakdown. But we needed to rest and we needed to be safe from the... Hmm. Pigmen. Well, anyways, a short moment or two later, we all had slid inside the cave, which actually opened quite well once you were inside. Kathy shivered a little as we scooted over a ways as one by one we sat down on a ledge. Ed and Katrina were last in as Danny and Jim gathered some of the sticks lying around and set about trying to cover the entrance a little. As Tick 
got to work on making a small fire. And as we sat there, we all kept our voices low, discussing the night's events. Not more than ten minutes later, and the sounds of grunting and squilling got closer and closer. Each of us held our breath as the three pigmen stepped just outside of our hiding hole. In here, we were essentially trapped, with no further way to travel inside of the cave. As we watched the hole with bated breath, their large, looming shadows came into view. Tick seemed sure that they wouldn't be able to fit through the small opening, but as their thick, stocky shoulders and large, round heads with classic, porcine ears atop of their heads crept ever closer in search of us. I was sure they would rush in at any moment. Myself and the others all trained our weapons at the opening as the three monstrous brutes grunted loudly and whispered wickedly to each other. It was the creepiest thing that I have ever heard. And then, just as their boots at the bottom of their trousers came into view, a loud hooping and loud crash of trees and brush sounded off a ways to our right and back the way we had came. Immediately, the three monstrous brutes grunted loudly and stomped off at a brisk pace. They giggled as they left, like sinister, twisted schoolboys. I was sure we didn't want to meet them, and from the look on everyone else's faces, they shared that sentiment too. As the sound of their stomping boots drifted into the distance, and we all took a large breath of relief. I looked at Jim, Danny, Kathy, and Ed's hands. All were white knuckled whilst gripping their respective firearms. Each of us shook a little as our stances relaxed and we holstered our weapons. And with raised eyebrows and moaning stomachs, we settled down for what remained of the night. And soon after eating some food and a glass or two of shine, we slowly drifted off into a deep slumber. Where werewolves, dogmen, skinwalkers, Dimension travelling Sasquatch or restless land spirits and certainly not pig-headed men were walking around and hunting out their next meal or next terrible deed. And so my friends, until next time, remember, be safe, not sorry. Wow, 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 wow. Hopefully another one. Wow. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Hope it was chest pounding, nerve racking, and heartstring pulling all at the same time. But of course, as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Already got started on part 6 guys, so look forward to that quite soon compared to this last update. Of course, if you are an aspiring writer, or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, why not get in touch with me at the usual email, which is dmtforestofear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's well and happy. Looking forward to getting stuck into a brand new week and aim high. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>